Good morning, Maurice. Good to see you, Bangjo. I think that uh, we have been talking for many years. Uh, thanks for joining our next wave uh, speaker series. So let's start with our discussion about actually uh, your company. Uh, the, I read that your motto of a publicist is Viva la difference. And I thought that was a very interesting motto given the time we are in, but yet the company was founded a long time ago. So clearly you saw something that we need to work on. So could you tell me a little bit about, about the company, number one, and number two, about the culture that are being able to carry on as a lasting, successful company that are not only a French company, but also a global company. Uh, interesting that you have uh, noticed this uh, Viva la Différence, and it's something which uh, is linked to what we do for a living and also how we do behave. Uh, what we do for a living is advertising, and the role of advertising is to create difference. Uh, what is making a product or a brand different from the other, and how to create a, a difference uh, of perception by the consumer. That is our very role, in order that the consumer prefer your brand rather than the competitive brand. And um, we have um, a, a few elements of differences. The first one is that uh, in this uh, field, which is uh, a very Anglo-Saxon field, uh, we were born in France uh, in, in the 20s, uh, so 1926, uh, in, in a country who doesn't really like uh, business. There has been always a distance from the French people to business, uh, a, a kind of defiance. And also the fact that uh, in the vast majority of the people, there is uh, a feeling that advertising is not one of the most noble industry. So we had to fight uh, and to impose ourselves uh, by being different, different from our competitors. And progressively, when we started to think about uh, the world, uh, we, we saw that uh, uh, one of uh, the key issues with uh, globalization was homogenization, and, or Americanization, if you prefer. And all the advertising agencies born in the US we are trying to export the US model. And I thought, OK, uh, we are different. Um, the consumer are not global. They are local. They have a different approach to consumption, but also to culture. And if we want to be part of this uh, global world, we have to recognize those differences. And progressively, we move from uh, not only uh, being different, but celebrating the differences of our people, not only respecting them for who they are, their inclination, their color of skin, their cultures, uh, their religion, but also uh, operating in a country and being a, a, a player in that country, which recognize all the differences of that country from another one, and being extremely respectful of those differences. And uh, this has created a corpus of values, which is uh, making us uh, a very strong company. In a world where, contrary to Samsung, where when you create a product, you have a physical product. We, we don't create a product. Uh, and our product is imagination, creativity, is about intelligence. And all this is something which is uh, intangible. And uh, honestly, this has really set up a, a part from the competition and created human values which are paramount to our people. So uh, given the, uh, your strong company culture 
and embracing diversity, embracing inclusiveness, they're embracing the creativity of different talent they can bring really early on. Clearly, you benefit the company to build where you are today. And I think it's really interesting, even for Samsung perspective, as one of your clients that uh, help us to build a global brand. And I think without, without support of imagination, creativity, as a product company alone, wouldn't be there. You have built a really big business. You are top three in the world, in the world of advertising. And the, uh, that world is changing as well. I think that two, two ways. One is around digitalization, uh, which will impact the traditional uh, advertising business. And then obviously pandemic is also creating an additional change. So I would love to hear your perspective of what are the impact of the digitalization given your uh, leadership and your involvement in the industry for so many years? The current situation is quite interesting. Uh, first of all, uh, the advertising world and the media world has changed dramatically uh, along the years. And if you look at the last century, what has happened was that uh, each new innovation, radio, television, etc., was an add-on and was not a substitute. So the market was growing with the innovation. Today, there is something which has changed quite dramatically because when you look at uh, what um, uh, digital has brought and internet and social networks is obviously new means of communication, personalization at scale, a possibility for each one to express himself or herself, and at the same time, it's no longer an add-on. It's no longer a cumulative effect. The market is growing, but at the same time, there are some media who are disappearing. The other aspect is that uh, consumers are spending uh, uh, endless hours on uh, internet and uh, TV. And when uh, the COVID happened, uh, this has even accelerated. If you look at our industry, uh, the changes are both very important and not important. I'm starting with the very important, which is that there is almost by the day a new medium, a new approach. Look at uh, TikTok. Three years ago, who was talking about TikTok? Who was talking about this new approach? Uh, or data and how we do a personalized message which go directly to one person. So the changes are huge and the way we work is, has been considerably affected by those changes. And at the same time, I'm saying not important. Why? Because fundamentally, in our business, there is something which will, in my view, never change, which is imagination. One is the imagination, the creative idea, uh, how to think differently and how to address a problem very differently from the competition. And the second, which is the emotional aspect, how to uh, create a relationship between the consumer and the brand, which is so strong that it is a, a permission for failure. So products, companies may change, but fundamentally, the way we connect with the people, consumers, creativity and emotional appeal doesn't change. So what you're saying is very profound and very important values that one have to think through. To get the company grow, clearly even though you're very established, early pioneers, you actually are very nimble. And I noticed also you are very aggressively expanding your strategy. And I think the, one of the things I noticed was really 
recognizing competitive ads that come from merging data with creative advertising. And you have made some major acquisitions of a $4 billion acquisition of Epsilon in 2019 that can be able to use AI to deliver more personalized, differentiated experience to customers at scale. And I thought that was a very interesting move for a company of your size being able to take on a whole new M&A acquisition to change and to adapt for the uh, where the future is going. So I'd love to hear your perspective of why you made a decision and how is it going and what are the lessons you learned from that M&A uh, experience? So we had to move very fast and to make a lot of acquisitions uh, in a world where we were seen as a great French company, but only a French company. And it has been a, a, a great journey because we were bringing a different alternative. It's back again to Viva la Différence. We were bringing an approach which was different from the others. So it has been a huge uh, uh, undertaking with uh, a, a lot of efforts. And then uh, at the end of the 90s, so before 2000, uh, we we are already seeing uh, the impact of mobile phone, of internet, and uh, I, I had decided that yes, we definitely had to be a great player, but this, because this will play a big role. And after the bubble burst, um, uh, uh, I said, okay, this will come back, and uh, we made the very first acquisition in that field with Digitas, in 2006 and it has been a journey with Digitas and then Resorfish and then Sapient and to finish with with uh, 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 Epsilon uh, in order to to make us a, a very different player integrating technology digital data and delivering end-to-end -end service to our clients seamlessly because what we saw a, a little bit in advance from our competition was that people uh, will need personalization. They will need to have a personal connection. All the acquisition have not worked well. And all the mergers that we have done have not been always a great success. The vast majority has been a fantastic success and has shaped a new world and a new group with um, data at its core, technology and creativity, uh, which are uh, uh, in a kind of alchemy. Uh, so we, we, we are a little bit like uh, uh, the, the people of the Middle Age, we are trying to transform lead in gold uh, and uh, the alchemy of technology, data and creativity is delivering something absolutely superb. So, Maurice, thank you for sharing your view about really multiple things about making changes, about working with uh, uh, M&A, integrating companies, the culture, some of your failures, and obviously your move with Omnicom would made you number one, the largest a uh, um, media company in the world, actually, that will be bigger than WPP. But sometimes I think it's wise to recognize understanding the differences and walk out of it, the table, rather than keep going. And I think that uh, open, as you know, it's not the industrial logic that makes the m &A successful. In fact, it is the soft things. It's about the people. It's about the leadership. It's about the culture. It's about how you work together, either break it, make it, and recognizing the risk and being able to making the right decision early on seems to be the right kind of core. So uh, the other thing I think about the running one of the largest organizations as a CEO, and um, you've been doing it for a long time, so clearly build the company very successfully. So I'd like to get your perspective as a CEO, now your chairman. So two questions I have, one is, what are some of the lessons you learned from your journey going up 
and through the rank of organization, you didn't get the job from CEO from somewhere because you came from the right family, not because you came from rich, but you actually build your career and moved up your career, you build your career. So I think it's, uh, it would be great if you can discuss what are some of the things that you would uh, provide to aspiring CEO as for them to be motivated. And also, I think some of the pitfalls, you know, what are some of the things that you say that you could done differently because we all have our own challenges and opportunities to improve. And then, of course, you also made a successful transition from CEO to chairman. And what are some of the things you have done tried to groom successor, which is not an easy thing to do, as you know, often whenever success, uh, transition happens, many companies fail. So I think this dynamics of CEO Build, becoming a successful CEO, and then transitioning to chairman and building the successor would be a very interesting discussion that applied to all of the CEOs that are out there that have to think through in their own career at some point. Uh, I have spent all my life, uh, my business life, uh, at Publicis. I joined the company in 1971, and next year it will be five decades. It will be my 50th anniversary, the Jubilee. Um, there is something which is hard to believe, but uh, when I joined the company, uh, I never, ever had a plan to say, OK, I'm entering like this, and I will jump there, and then I will go there, and then I, I, I will try to get that job, and then this job, never. I had not what we call a career plan, never. The only thing I have done uh, is fully committed. It happens that when I joined, I loved the company immediately. I fell in love. Uh, my wife used to say that um, uh, publicist uh, is not my mistress, but my real life, uh, wife. So it's a, it's a large share of my life, and uh, I have been committed. I love the people. I had a mentor, uh, the, the chairman CEO, the founder, who has been absolutely extraordinary with the lessons that he was giving me. And uh, I, 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 I took every single challenge as a, 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 a very important one. It has been a journey where I was uh, devoting myself completely with maybe three or four key things which are extremely important. The first one, I think uh, that I was a good listener. Second is passion. Till now, I have still the same passion for the company, for the industry, uh, for the work. So passion for the work, passion for the client, respect. Respect for the people. Uh, and uh, something that I have done very early on, when we were working on a campaign, a client, a strategy, I wanted that the whole team was together because I was considering that ideas are not hierarchical and that a young assistant can have a as good idea as the senior executive. And I wanted that the whole team feel that they are part of the same challenge and they can contribute and they can be respected whatever is their contribution. Last but not least, I have always put the interest of the company before mine. You know, I was, as I was listening to you, Maurice, some of the core values they talk about for your success actually, in a way, uh, reflects you know, values we see today that may be old-fashioned, maybe, but actually it is a core value that I see at Samsung as well. It's about commitment. It's about passion. And it's about also your journey about being able to have the right mentors that can be able to give you the kind of things that you need to get support on, to learn from. 
And then obviously your own demeanor about how you then seek the listening and making sure your partner, your customers are winners as you're going through the journey. These are all the right kind of core values that we also uh, try to uh, educate uh, in our organizations. So uh, Maurice, there's one last question, and this is to do with our joint partnership as well. As you know, I've been many years now, I've been involved with uh, the importance initiative around Tech for Good. Uh, that was really driven by French uh, President, President Macron. And obviously you are behind working and putting together the CEO um, Tech for Good Council to enable to discuss very important subject, which I thank you for it. And as a member of the council, I feel honored to meet other CEOs and talking about the, what are some of the critical issues like inclusion, or the uh, diversity, or the issues around the um, disparity in income and other important subjects of today, and also including AI. What's the implication of AI? What are the ethics of AI? What's the role of the government? What's the role of the industry? I just want to get your view of where it's going, but also how do you see that we can work together even more going forward to make a bigger impact? Uh, first of all, I must say that uh, your contribution uh, to uh, uh, Take for Good and uh, to the reflection of the group is highly regarded. I know also that uh, you, you have done something which is uh, fantastic with the Extreme Tech Challenge, the XTC, which is uh, uh, quite remarkable because uh, thanks to your initiative, uh, there has been some great startups which have been recognized for what they are doing and uh, which will help solving some of the issues. When it comes to VivaTech, uh, we are working on uh, a plan for 2021 which we believe will be quite unique. But at the same time, we are working also on some other s technical solutions in order to have a, either as a complement or as a substitute because of what can, can happen with uh, the pandemic. I love uh, the expression, and I will close with that, the expression of Albert Einstein, who was saying, imagination is more important than knowledge. I'm hoping that we can be able to meet in VivaTech in June 2021, and I'm hoping also we can continue to push our Tech for Good effect uh, event and uh, extreme tech challenge that we initiated as a nonprofit to way of getting corporations, startups to work together on the areas of impact that can change and contribute to a better world. And something that we would love to announce the winners of that 2021 competition at Viva Tech when I see you in Paris at that moment. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, you have been uh... Uh, a great interviewer, and it has been uh, great to see you, my friend. And I look forward to seeing you in person uh, next year at VivaTech. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.